The rain pelted hard onto the ground, turning the dirt to marshy land. Thunder roared fiercely as the early morning darkness veiled the derelict field, lit only simultaneously by the occasional whip of lightning, revealing flashes of a dark figure far across the field, just beyond the brush, a bulk man wearing a plaid shirt that was mostly now brown from the dirt that had splashed him as he pushed his shovel hard into the mud over and over splattering him all over his white shirt and baggy jeans he had been working for some time breaking into a sweat as he worked away on digging the hole that very deep hole after hours of work, he threw the shovel aside and wiped his brow, a sigh puffing out of his cheeks as another flash of lightning interrupted the darkness. He studied the hole he had made for a few seconds until he was satisfied. Satisfied that it would be a good fit before turning to the lumpy-shaped black bin bag that lay heavily beside him. He lifted it up with a strained growl and threw it lazily into the hole with a thud. Another roar of thunder shook the ground as he reached for the shovel once again and began filling the hole, the handle slipping through his gloved grasp with each strike. Now, if you're thinking this man is in the wrong, then I guess you would be correct. And if you think that black bin bag consists of, well, <clears throat> someone, then you would also be correct. You were wise for listening to your gut there. That was very wise indeed. But do not get it all twisted, for he isn't all bad. We all have a good and bad side to all of us. It just matters which one you decide to act upon, which one you let tip the scales, if only slightly. So you see, with this philosophy, Intention, my friend, means everything. And this man right here, he had good intentions at heart. Oh, I know it doesn't appear that way, but my dear, accidents happen, and he simply happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Call it bad luck, if you will. But that is how the tornado hit. That is how the butterfly effect came to be. Like I mentioned earlier, accidents happen, and this man right here simply did what he had to do, what he thought was best. So please, try not to judge too harshly. At least, not yet. As he dumped the last few piles of dirt onto where the body now lay, now five feet under, he wondered, wondered how he managed to get himself into this mess. He pondered why he had to be the man with this bad luck, thought about why ultimate misfortune seemed to follow him wherever he went contemplated how such things came to be, confused at how these unfortunate situations that cornered him would escalate so quickly, how he was able to do what he did. But as thunder rumbled and a white flash of lightning stabbed the darkness, mostly he wondered, wondered why, why it had felt so good.
Stewart was your everyday man. He had a nine to five job. He went grocery shopping and he enjoyed sport. All those sorts of things. He played by the rules, plain and simple. Now, part of this average white male routine involved riding the bus. He rode the bus to and from his simple office job every day. Every day, without fail, he would be standing at that bus stop, ready for the 8.30 a.m. bus, and then the 6.30 bus home. Every day. What can I say? He was a creature of habit. Now, Stuart wasn't much of a talker. He's a simple man. You'd be lucky to get so much as a muffled grunt out of him when conversing. Unless you were to mention sports or hunting, that is. Otherwise, I'd say your luck is better elsewhere. But this didn't stop Mr. Gruber from trying. Mr. Gruber was a simple man just the same. I guess you could say his name was a little more rare is all. And I guess he was just that little bit more eccentric. But a simple man all the same. He always meant well. Always striking up a conversation with anyone that tickled his fancy. A gentle soul, easily able to converse with anyone who crossed his path. I guess you could say that his social skills peaked over his skill of dressing himself, though. He was quite the sight with his bright red checked slack trousers and his ill-fitted deep purple polo shirt. He reminded Stuart of someone who had to dress for court, but just really didn't want to change out of their pyjamas. Every day, Mr. Gruber would ride the same bus as Stuart. Stuart had no idea where Mr. Gruber headed every day. He just knew he was a familiar face. He had gotten used to seeing Mr. Gruber every day, talking to anyone that came along, talking to the lady with the pram, talking to the old woman with curlers in, with the young boy that always carried his guitar on his back. Oh, and the teenager with the stupid short tie, and the old woman with the dog. Oh, and don't forget the businesswoman that is passionate about saving the environment or whatever. But it was rather easy to recognize Mr. Gruber regardless, since he wore the same silly clothes every day anyway. But he hadn't yet spoke to the middle-aged man. He hadn't yet spoke to Stuart. No... Not yet. The Monday morning was dull and bleak, how you'd expect any Monday morning to be. But on this particular Monday, a heavy white fog engulfed the hills, sneaking its way into the streets, making Stuart's neighborhood look like an artist's rendering with no background. Stuart set out at the door to the bus stop, leaving his small house behind. After a quick breakfast of toast and black coffee, he swiftly made his way to the regular stop just to wait a full 10 minutes and 45 seconds for his bus to arrive. His breath left his shrilly short-haired lips to swirl into the air, joining the thick fog that hung over the town as he stepped onto the bus and out of the cold. The usual, please, he said to the driver in a nonchalant tone, rolling back and forth on his feet and wringing his hands from having been in the cold, letting out a sigh as he enjoyed the soft 
gush of warmth from the bus's radiators and waited for his ticket. There was the familiar thring of the register, an exchange of cash, and that was it. He left to sit in his regular seat, close to the end of the bus, but not directly at the back, but not in the middle either. He was precise. He was average, but he made choices with purpose. He liked routine. He took the seat and stared lazily out of the window, holding the bus ticket in his gloved hand. You would have never have thought that the same man had committed murder just the night before. Never. A few stops went by, and not another soul joined the bus. The usuals, like the old woman with the funny colours, and that teenager with the stupid fat tie, were nowhere to be seen. Stuart reasoned that it must have been the fog, or maybe the sharp cold that hung in the air. I guess that it's not particularly pleasant for anyone. Unless, of course, you were Stuart. Stuart couldn't have cared less either way. He didn't feel much. Weather was just weather to him. Well, besides being an insufferable topic of conversation. At around the fourth or fifth stop, someone stepped onto the bus. Good morning. One return ticket into town today, please, kind madam, said Mr. Gruber. The driver didn't say a word, and the thring of the register was the only thing that offered a reply. She handed the man a ticket and he returned with a spring in his step towards the rest of the bus, before scanning for his temporary companions, that is. Stuart instantly recognised the elderly man from the obscure clothes that he was wearing. His formal pyjamas looking attire almost brought a smile to Stuart's face. Almost. What a ridiculous way to dress, he thought, as he saw the old man walk up the aisle and towards him in his peripherals. Of course, you can guess that Stuart didn't acknowledge Mr. Gruber. Don't have to be a scholar to estimate that much. Mr. Gruber took a seat, directly next to Stuart, that is. Oh no, swiped through Stuart's mind as he still continued to stare out of the window, not acknowledging the old man. Good morning, kind sir. I hope you're well today. He greeted Stuart in a chipper tone. Now, Stuart might have been quiet and a little rude, maybe even a little bit mean at times, but he wasn't stone cold. At least, he thought he wasn't. So he humoured Mr. Gruber with a mumbled response. Morning, he said, not taking his eyes from the window. Golly gosh! It's like a ghost town this morning. Funny how there's no other riders, isn't it? Must be this cold weather. Mustn't be pleasant for anyone. There it was, Stuart thought. The weather. Stuart didn't bother humouring him with a response the second time. Oh, no matter. I'm sure the weather will clear up soon. Shouldn't be long till this fog lifts, I'm guessing, he said reassuringly. Once again, Stuart did not offer the man an answer. Mr. Gruber sat in silence for a few moments. 
something Stuart hadn't seen him do before, before coming out with something else. But dear me, the gentle old man began. I must say, I had a terribly weird dream last night. It was most peculiar, he said, crossing his brow as though deep in thought. Stuart kept silent, holding back the urge to roll his eyes. It was a terribly weird one, my young one. Terribly weird indeed. Would you mind if I were to tell it to you? Stuart simply sent a rough grunt in response. He figured the old man was going to tell him the boring, loopy dream anyway. So what was the use? Mr. Gruber began his story, but Stuart still found the blank sheet of fog more interesting. He didn't take his eyes away from the fog as Mr. Gruber began to descend into a retelling of some loopy dream that was probably just a side effect of his meds. Oh, it was rather strange. I dare say it was the most peculiar dream I've ever had. Except for that one where I dreamt I was making tea with my slippers on my hands and gloves on my feet. <laughs> the old man chuckled a little. Stuart inwardly pleaded for escape. He went on, his cracked chuckle fading. No, this one was a little different. I almost felt I hadn't slept at all, it was so odd. Well, what I remember first, he said, crossing his brow as if lost in thought, was that it was a stormy night, just like it had been the last night. I've never been fond of the noon lightning, so that must have been why, he said. Sigh tracked. Stuart held back the urge to sigh, not shifting his gaze from the fog. So weird, he said in a low whisper. I was in someone else's room, I was, talking to a man. He was a quite well-dressed gentleman, but he seemed angry with me for something. Not too sure what, though. He said this with leaning into Stuart slightly and lifting up a pointed finger. Oh, gosh, he was so angry, yelling and screaming, all that horrible stuff. He shook his head lightly. I must have done something terribly wrong because he was very angry very angry indeed and he just kept coming closer and closer shouting in my face now i hate to talk ill of people but this gentleman's spit was flying all over the place i felt it on my face and all that all of it, ah, oh, it was rather ghastly, if I must say, he said with a slight grimace. Stuart actually crossed his eyebrows in response, a little response at that. Oh, yes, young one, the old man went on. So strange twas, but the next thing I know, the man had pulled out a pocket knife and was waving it to my neck. You could hear the shock in his voice. Ah, young one, I was terribly shocked. And such a peckable gentleman as well. Ah. He tutted a little with a tone of disappointment. Ah, oh, but do you know, I had a knife myself as well. I must have been hiding it, I must have. And do you know, I stabbed him first. 
I stabbed him in the neck, I did, over and over. Ah, oh, it was most unpleasant, young one, most unpleasant indeed. The old man shook his head slightly. It was awful. The gentleman's blood was everywhere. I was outright flabbergasted, I was. I thought it was the most unusual thing. I thought it was just most unusual that I would think to do something like that. Even in a dream, a little old frail man like me would never have overpowered a gentleman like that. He paused. Although, he was a rather small-framed man, now I think about it. He said this more to himself than to Stuart. Ah, but do you know, I didn't stop there. No, I didn't. Oh, it was awful. I just kept attacking the poor fellow, even bashing his head with a few of his ornaments. It was such a horrible dream, it was. He shook his head solemnly. Stuart shifted his eyes, offering the old man a side glance. He waited for him to go on. Ah, oh, young one, I really didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. I do apologize if this is a bit too much for you, young one. I get that. It isn't very pleasant. I'm having a hard time retelling it myself, if I'm honest. And then after that, the scene completely changed. You know how funny dreams are, he said, nudging Stuart's elbow a little. But yes, it changed it did, if I remember correctly. That's when I remember that awful thunder and lightning. Except I was in a field. I'm sure the field would have been quite the pretty one in the day. And the sunshine and all that, you know. But I was walking through it in the pelting rain and the horrible storm I was. <laughs> How strange is that? Oh, but young one, it was most unpleasant. It was actually rather frightening. He finished tying the ending with a slight sigh. Ah, <sighs> rather frightening. Stuart said nothing. He was just staring wide-eyed at the blank fog in silence as his beating heart felt as though it was shouting a thousand words. Ah, oh, you know, I've had other dreams similar to this where they are so utterly strange I even dare to call it a nightmare sometimes. But no, this one, this one felt... He trailed off. Real. He said the last word, more so as a question than a statement. Stuart had not uttered a word not even so much as offered a muffled grunt. He just sat there, in silence, staring wide-eyed into the thick fog, frozen. He was frozen with utter shock and confusion. He sat how he had always sat. From the outside, he looked calm and collected, too cool to care. But on the inside, his insides were running a thousand miles, feeling like fire and ice ran through his veins all at once, 
sending rushing blood to his crashing heart as its stomach joined the chaos letting go a flip after flip he broke out into a cold sweat. The old man leant forward slightly, stealing a quick glance at Stuart. Oh dear me, he said through his soft, crooked voice. You're looking awfully pale, my young one. Oh, I'm awfully sorry if my story upset you. It was rather gruesome, wasn't it? I don't particularly like those sorts of stories either. Makes it even stranger why I would dream something like that up, eh? He said in an uplifting tone, nudging Stuart slightly in the side. Stuart would have vomited there and then if he didn't feel as though he had been frozen still. The bus slowed to a crawl, and the old man stood up. Now, you take care of yourself now, Sonny, all right? Make sure you head straight home if you're not feeling chipper, all right? Stuart didn't respond. All right, good, he said, as if he had received a good answer. Well, any answer at all, actually. You have a good day now, he said, sending the nicety towards Stuart from halfway down the bus aisle before stepping off the bus, disappearing into the fog. Stuart still said nothing, did nothing. He was trying hard to hold down the vomit and calm the storm that raged inside him as one thought raced through his mind over and over. How did he know?